This is a production of Cornell University. Well, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the dedication ceremony for the Robert W. Hawley uh, Center for Agriculture and Health, which is the USDA Agricultural Research Service Laboratory, formerly known as the U.S. Plant Soil Nutrition Lab. I'm Leon Cochin, the center director. And to begin, I'd like you all to stand and, and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And before we start our series of five speeches for the ceremony, I'd like to uh, introduce our honored uh, guests and speakers in the front row. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce the Honorable Maurice Hinchy, Member of Congress from the 22nd District. Uh, next, the USDA Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics, Dr. Gail Buchanan. The Associate Administrator for the Agricultural Research Service, Dr. Antoinette Bechart. <laughs> Wilda Martinez, who has recently retired from the position of Area Director for the North Atlantic Area. <laughs> the current Acting Area Director, Dr. Darius Wetlick. and the Deputy Area Director for the North Atlantic Area, Carlos Santoyo. <laughs> the Deputy Administrator for Crop Production for the ARS National Program staff, Judy St. John, Dr. Judy St. John. And the Special Advisor to the Undersecretary of Agriculture, Joseph, Dr. Joseph Dunn. And then from Cornell, the Vice Provost for Life Sciences, Dr. Steve Kresovich. The Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, Dr. Susan Henry. The Senior Associate Deans of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, first Dr. Barbara Newth. And Dr. Jan Nyrop. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm the first speaker, so I'm going to get right into it. I don't need an introduction. And um, I'm going to be talking about the history of the lab and the work of Bob Holley that uh, resulted in his awarding of the Nobel Prize. So the uh, concept for the U.S. Plant Soil and Nutrition Lab came from a blue rib ribbon committee that was established by the uh, Secretary of Agriculture in 1936. And this panel of scientists recommended that research be conducted on essential trace elements in the soil and their bioavailability in plant foods for humans and animals that consume those foods. So that was the driving force behind the Plant Soil and Nutrition Lab. The funding for the lab was approved in 1939 and construction began. And that construction went quickly in those days. It was completed in 1940 and occupied in 1940. A little different than today. And here's a picture from 1940 of the lab being constructed. Um, you can see this is the end of this. There is no tower road here. This was the edge of campus, and you can see there's no tower road to be seen. Looking at some of the facilities, I would surmise that I don't think OSHA was a uh, federal agency at the time. And then here's the lab completed, but not landscaped. You can see that there's one wing missing that was added later. This was one of the first labs to have greenhouses on the roof. And, and I love this photo, very dramatic, the clouds and the cows grazing in the front yard. And then here it is uh, several months later, landscape, and it's landscaped, and so now you can hear, here's Tower Road, which was gravel. This is the end of Tower Road, so the lab was at the end of the road. And one final shot, this is a shot, here's the lab looking down Tower Road towards the center of campus, and the vista is quite a bit different than today, right? Quite a few, but fewer buildings. There's Stocking Hall, Rice Hall, and I believe is this um, uh, Mann Library and, and, plant, and Plant Science. So the, the mission of the lab 
was to improve the nutritional quality of food crops by studying the food chain, that is the movement of essential minerals from soils to plants and then on to the animals and humans that ate those uh, plant food crops. So this was you know, truly transdisciplinary research. It was research at the interface of human nutrition and crop agricultural production systems and plant nutrition. And I think the founders of the lab had a, a unique vision because you know, what, what was proposed here was truly multidisciplinary. It brought together soil scientists, plant biologists, and human nutritionists under one roof to work on improving, working together to improve the nutritional quality and health promoting properties of food crops. And it's a mission that still resonates today. It's becoming clear that food systems globally are not providing adequate quantities of certain essential micronutrients, particularly iron, zinc, and vitamin A. This is particularly for um, uh, populations of developing countries, but also for certain U.S. population groups. So this is still an important mission of the Holly Center today. So as I mentioned, uh, the, the full expansion of the lab occurred in 1963. This wing was added on and the greenhouses were removed in a third floor and um, uh, attic were added. And during the, uh, the, the first uh, 20 years of the lab, there was quite a, I think, some, I think it's a lab that has had a, a rich history of scientific accomplishment. Research such as investigations of vitamin content of foods and the effects of environmental factors on that. One of the ma major impact researches was um, developing geographic maps for the, uh, for the showing the spatial variation in trace elements in soils and plants across the United States. And these maps were widely used by ranchers, farmers, epidemiologists, veterinarians for both plant and livestock health. So then we come to Robert Holly, shown here in front of the uh, nutrition lab. I think I'm going to... Turn that down a bit. Um, so Dr. Howley joined the lab in 1957. He did his undergraduate degree at the University of Illinois in chemistry, and then he came to Cornell for his PhD in biochemistry. He worked with uh, Professor Vigneault in, in biochemistry, who he himself got the Nobel Prize for synthesizing the first polypeptide hormone. Uh, Bob Howley's contribution in that lab, he helped contribute to the first chemical synthesis of penicillin in that lab. So, uh, so following his PhD, he was a postdoctoral fellow at Washington State University. And then in 1948, he took a faculty position at Cornell at the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station at Geneva, where he was a natural products chemist. And Bob there worked on at, uh, look, investigating primary and secondary compounds in food crops. One of his major projects was looking at flavor components in grape and grape juice. Um, now, while he was at Cornell, he met his wife-to-be, Ann Dworak, and she was also a chemist, and, and after they were married, they co-authored a number of the publications that came from the, uh, from the Geneva lab. In 1955, he went on sabbatical to James Bonner's lab at Caltech on a Guggenheim Fellowship, and this is where he got interested in protein synthesis. It was an area, it was a hot emerging area, but not very much was known about it. Uh, scientists were able to, just very recently, before they were able to synthesized proteins in a test tube in vitro, so there was a lot of excitement. And they knew that nucleic acids were involved in possibly RNA, but not much beyond that. So when Bob came back from Caltech to Geneva, he decided he wanted to work in this area, this much more fundamental research area. And I think that gave the USDA lab an opportunity to recruit him here, and he came here in 1957. But he had two projects. He had the project on protein synthesis, the molecular basis of protein synthesis, but he also had a more applied project where he was working on a birth defect disorder in sheep being raised in the West, it was a disorder called a monkey face or psychopsia, and they were eating a toxic forage, veratum, and he used his natural products chemistry expertise to show that it was alkaloids in this that were causing the birth defects. But as the protein synthesis work became more and more successful, that was what he focused much of his, uh, his time on. So, I mean, we now know quite a bit about protein synthesis, of course. You've got to remember, in the late 50s, we knew much less. At that time, there were these soluble RNAs that, once you precipitate, precipitated out the much larger 
uh, DNA and mRNA, there were soluble RNAs, and they were suspected to be involved in protein synthesis. Here is the classic cloverleaf structure of the of transfer RNAs, and, and as an aside, this is now the, the, the logo of our, uh, of our center. Uh, so Bob Howley's research in the 50s, he was one of the first to propose that it was these soluble RNAs that would possibly transfer RNAs. They would grab a particular amino acid at their five prime end, uh, uh, do uh, um, uh, hydrogen bonding with the, the codon on the mRNA, and hence be able to insert the uh, amino acid in its proper location in the uh, growing polypeptide. But not much was known beyond that. And so uh, he started assembling a team using uh, base funds from ARS. He also had ultimately some funding from NIH and NSF, but it was a team of ARS um, support scientists, postdocs, and Cornell graduate students. And it was really a daunting task. I mean, the first step is they had to purify enough of a specific transfer RNA to, to uh, sequence that polynucleic acid. Um, and they calculated they needed about a gram of transfer RNA. Well, there's not one tRNA, there's something like 31 with several tRNAs for each of the 20 amino acids. And the technique they, they used was a new emerging technique called countercurrent distribution. They would extract the tRNA crude extract from rat livers and run it through this countercurrent distribution to try to get a specific tRNA for a specific amino acid. Well, Dr. Howley did some back of the envelope calculations and figured out he would need about a million rats to do this, and he said that wasn't going to work. So he started casting around, and serendipitously, they found that brewer's yeast was a good source of, of active tRNA, and so they, that's what they used, and they ultimately purified one gram of alanine tRNA from 300 pounds of brewer's yeast. And the reason they chose the alanine tRNA is it was one that just it separated out because of its properties away from all the other ones, so it was the easiest one to purify. Well, the next step was to, to sequence this transfer RNA to determine its, uh, its, 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 its nucleic acid sequence and uh, its primary structure. And again, you've got to remember, this is uh, in, in the days when they were identifying the individual nucleotides with paper chromatography. So the strategy they used was to use specific ribonucleases. Some of those were just being discovered around then and purified to cleave the tRNA at, at specific bases. And so they would cleave it, say, into 15 to 17 fragments. They would determine the uh, nucleotide base content of each of those, and they would then overlap them in kind of a tiling path. They would cleave it with a different ribonuclease. And this was quite tedious work. They had to clean up each, take months to clean all the nonspecific RNases from this. And as they were making progress through the, this, was, this work started, uh, uh, the purification with the, to get one gram of tRNA finished up about 1960, 61, and then the sequencing be began through the uh, 1960s. Um, and the final key step was to find a gentle way to split the uh, alanine tRNA, which is 77 bases long, into two long fragments and, re and split it reproducibly. And uh, they were finally able to do that and overlay that over all of the other fragments. It was kind of like a linear jigsaw puzzle. And finally, by 1964, they had determined the full uh, sequence of the alanine tRNA. So this was the first sequence of a polynucleic acid and a tRNA. And so I want to then acknowledge uh, the team of scientists, of ARS and Cornell scientists that were involved in this. And uh, I think the key members are either shown here or, or mentioned here. Jean Apgar was an ARS support scientist and then during this time got her PhD with Bob and then joined the permanent staff at the nutrition lab. Jim Madison was a postdoc at the time and then joined the permanent staff. There were both scientists there when I started in 1985. John Penswick was a PhD student at Cornell. George Everett and Susan Merrill were ARS support scientists and George was at the lab when I started. And the not shown was Elizabeth Keller, who was recruited by Bob Howley from, in the biochemistry department at Cornell, and she was on, later on the faculty in biochemistry at Cornell. And then Cornell PhD student Mark Marcusy and a postdoctoral fellow, Ada Zamir. So they were publishing papers through the early 60s to about 1964, um, and the excitement was building in the scientific community. And then they completed this work at the end of 64, and the seminal paper came out in March 
1965 in science. The title was Structure of a Ribonucleic Acid, and we're here where they presented the first uh, primary structure of a transfer RNA, the first primary structure of a nucleic acid. And this certainly opened up many different avenues of research, all the way from medicine to agriculture, and I think is the, the forerunner of the current genomics revolution. And I think, you know, the significance of this discovery was, is indicated by just three short years later, Dr. Holly was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1968 for medicine or physiology. He shared it with Marshall Nuremberg and Hargo Ben Karana. All three of them were working on different aspects of the molecular basis of protein synthesis. Now, as I mentioned, the science paper came out in March of 1965. In November of 1965, um, Dr. Holly was awarded the Albert Lasker Award, and that's the highest award in medicine. So again, I think this is unique, an agricultural research service scientist getting the highest award in medicine for his work with his transfer RNA. And this is a picture from the article in Medical Science News on him getting the Lasker Award, and it shows Bob Holly with his son Fred Holly raking leaves in their front yard of their house in Cayuga Heights. Well, Fred Holly and I have been corresponding since last fall when we decided to, you know, to try to make this the Robert Holly Center. Um, and he very much wanted to be here. He's a respected MD in Palo Alto, but unfortunately it's one of these things trying to get everybody together here. He's on an extended lecture tour with his wife in Italy, and he'll be in Italy for most of, of, of uh, May. But he did send me a letter, and he had, sent me some comments that he asked me to read, which I'm going to do now. First of all, I should say that I greatly regret not being there in person, and I would like to thank Dr. Cochin for reading a few remarks and allowing me to tell you a couple of reminiscences. When Dr. Cochin called me last year to tell me of the decision to name the lab in my father's honor and to ask the, father's, the family's permission, I immediately gave it with great enthusiasm. I truly believe that my father spent the happiest and most productive years of his research career there at the USDA lab. A story which illustrates my father's innovative and basic principles approach to science relates to the separation of the transfer RNA fragments on a gel column. At the time, a gel column and fraction collector was the newest technology available for separating the multi-base pieces of RNA which were cut from the full tRNA by restriction enzymes. My father calculated that in order to separate the tRNA fragments, the column would have to be 40 feet long. Most people would have thrown up their hands and said, not possible. My father looked at the USGA building and said, it's tall enough. <laughs> so we built the apparatus inside and installed it in the stairwell. So it ran from the attic, uh, on, which is the fourth floor, to the basement where the fraction collector, collector was. And I heard many stories of this when I joined the lab in 1984, and hence that work was done. Those were golden years for science and highly productive ones for my father. Funding was ample, reasonably open-ended, and allowed him to pursue a fishing expedition that might prove difficult now. But equally important was the work environment, whose tradition I'm sure you are continuing with a smooth-running, efficient infrastructure, a dedicated and hard-working staff, and an able and supportive director. My father did his best work as a scientist when he could spend at least half of his time in his lab, not in the office. He could design experiments better when he knew the techniques intimately and could note the little anomalies and results that point up new directions of inquiry. It was his freedom from administrative responsibilities in part that gave him the time and concentration to perform his best scientific work. I hope you are continu continuing the tradition of the lab in this spirit. He would be most honored. Okay, so in 19, late 1964, he, Dr. Holly was a hot commodity. A number of universities were making him offers. And he wanted to stay in the Ithaca area, so in 64, he took a faculty position, moved across campus to the biochemistry department here. And in fact, he was the acting chair of biochemistry in 65 uh, um, uh, until um, Ephraim Racker came in 66 to be the permanent chair. But when he left the nutrition lab, he wanted to work on something new. He started working on cancer research, looking at cell proliferation. So he took a sabbatical at the Salk Institute, because that was a center for learning cell culture, and then he ended up staying at the Salk Institute as a staff scientist for the remainder of his career until he passed away in 1993. And this, this photo here is when he returned after he got the Nobel Prize, gave a several, series of lectures at the lab, and presented this plaque which has hung in the lab ever since, uh, dedicating that the work was done for the Nobel Prize, the majority of the work was done there at the USDA lab. 
So now I want to briefly acknowledge some of the other scientists who were um, contemporaries of his at the Nutrition Lab, and they're scientists that are retired and here in the audience. John Thompson is a plant biochemist who uh, helped recruit Bob Holly to the lab, and you can see him working with an, with an older Jim Madison. They worked for many years after Bob left on plant protein synthesis. Daryl Van Campen was a postdoc with Bob for one year, but then he took a permanent faculty position, a permanent position at the uh, nutrition lab as a human nutritionist in iron nutrition. He told me, you know, I got out before they made the discovery. I missed out on all that Nobel Prize glory. But uh, he subsequently became the lab director and was a director for 17 years until he retired in 1997. And again, you see him here with, with Jim Madison and Lorraine Holowack, a, a, a technician. Hub Alley was the director at the time, and from what I heard, he was a wonderful man and a very able lab director. Earl Carey was our analytical chemist. He was there when I came on board and very ably did all the mineral analysis for, for the lab. And then slightly more recently, Bill House uh, was a human nutritionist working on zinc nutrition, and Dave Grunes was an agronomist who worked on problems of mineral nutrition disorder and, and forage crops that impacted uh, um, livestock. So now I want to fast forward for the last few minutes of this talk to the last 10 years to talk about how we became a center. So in 1997, when I became lab director, I started working with Wilda Martinez, my area director and my mentor and friend. And we worked together and she challenged me, said, okay, you've, you've, you're, you're the lab is still doing the type of research, maybe not the same quality, but the type of research Bob Holly does, fundamental research that can be translated into crop improvement. So we both said, how can we take advantage of the genomics revolution for crop improvement? At the same time, Steve Tanksley was starting up the genomics initiative at Cornell, and we talked, and he liked the idea of using genomics to improve the nutritional quality and abiotic stress tolerance of food crops. So he became a very strong advocate for us, and I think we're indebted to him, and also to Susan Henry and Steve Kresovich for their support at Cornell. Um, on the ARS side, to grow you need funding, and here's where I need to acknowledge Judy St. John and Leland Ellis from the National Program staff, and again, Wilda. And uh, through, many, through all of their efforts, we began to grow, and we expanded over a 10-year period from seven scientists to 19. And I think ARS looked at us as a center where they could invest in cutting-edge new technologies. And part of the reason is because we're, we're housed here at the Cornell campus. But we were added scientists in plant molecular biology and genomics, plant molecular statistical and quantitative genetics, proteomics, and computational biology. And in fact, we were the first ARS lab to hire computational biologists. They were Sam Kottenauer and Dave Schneider. And uh, in fact, we had to create the position descriptions for this because uh, it was a new position in ARS. Now, there was another line of growth also. There was a separate research unit, the Plant Protection Research Unit, that uh, was started in the early 80s. And their mission is to use biocontrol, biological methods to control insect pests of plants and also plant diseases. And the initial director was Dick Soper and then Bill Brody. They moved into the USDA lab building in 1991. And, they, and then Donna Gibson became their, their, their research leader and still is. And they also grew in the areas of nursery crop, pest control, biocontrol, and emerging pests. So about two years ago, we're sitting here with 27 scientists and not much structure. And we we'll, said, so we need to work to come up with a, a structure so we can more efficiently administer the scientists and, and efficiently conduct our science. And in the end, make a long story short, we reorganized into the center with three separate research units with different missions, but with, that, with relationships between all three. And if you come over to the lab for the open house after this, you can see posters on each mission. Now, I, 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 I'm proud of it. I think we have excellent scientists, and I think we've continued a tradition of outstanding research. And this, uh, this animated slide is just showing you the cover page from papers over the last three to four years led by Holly Center scientists that have published in very high-profile journals such as Science, Nature, Nature Genetics, PNAS, Plant Cell, and other, and other important journals. Scientists have also been very effective in getting extramural grant funding from a number of different agencies to continue their ARS mission-oriented research and, and leverage their base funds. But there's a cost for all this growth. We've, we're much 
too crowded for the building. So here we have an aerial photograph of this end of campus. We're now right here in the James Law Auditorium, and right next door, you'll walk over here after the talks are over, is the Rahali Center. Here's our building. We have 27 scientists, 13 of them are in the building, and the building is stuffed to the gills. So you see all these other circles. We have scientists housed in all of these Cornell and, and buildings and also Boyce Thompson Institute. Um, and this also indicates the really great relationship we have with Cornell and Boyce Thompson and the partnerships. Okay, but our vision is to bring all these people back to the USDA lab. And this is where I have to thank and sincerely thank and acknowledge <coughs> Congressman Hinchy. It's through his efforts and the effort of his staff that we have the funding towards a new $40 million building. Um, here's the architectural rendition of it. Here's the existing lab. It'll built, be built behind the lab. Um, we're just finishing the design and we have some of the funding for it and hope to have the rest of the funding in time to have it built sometime maybe in the next five or six years. <coughs> so in closing, to me, looking at that new building is looking to the future and what, I, what we, we hope we'll be able to do is to build upon the legacy started by Bob Holly of conducting high quality fundamental research. Um, that can be translated fairly rapidly into real improvements in agriculture. Thank you. You have to excuse me. I had to make a microphone change there. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Steve Krasovich. Steve is a professor in the departments of plant breeding and plant biology. He's also the director of the Institute for Genomic Diversity and vice provost for life sciences. Steve received his bachelor degree in biology from Washington and Jefferson College, his master's degree in agronomy from Texas A&M, and his PhD in crop physiology and genetics from the Ohio State University. Following graduation, he conducted research in crop breeding and biotechnology at the Battelle Memorial Institute in Texas A&M. But he was then one of us. He joined ARS, and he worked at ARS for 11 years, the best 11 years of his life. First as the uh, research leader of the plant germplasm repository out at Geneva, and then he was the director of a similar germplasm repository in Georgia. In 1998, he joined the faculty at Cornell. So Steve and I collaborate on a several, several projects. So I can tell you firsthand, he is truly an outstanding scientist with an international reputation. He's internationally recognized in the areas of conservation genetics and improvement of cereal crops, in particular, sorghum, maize, and pearl millet. Steve. It's really great to be here. Um, it's a wonderful day and wonderful people here visiting. It's nice to see a lot of people in the group. On behalf of President Scorton, and Provost Biddy Martin, we're really honored to be here as part of the unveiling of the Robert W. Hawley Center for Agriculture and Health. And as Leon indicated, I have a soft spot and, a, and I'm always grateful for the ARS collaborations that I've had over the years. It's been a wonderful group to work for, and it's a wonderful group to work with now that I'm at Cornell. In the brief time that I have to speak, I'd like to address not the past as Leon did, but build on the past and take a look to the future, particularly building on current relationships. So along with Cornell and the Boyce Thompson Institute for Plant Research, the Hawley Center is a shining star in the constellation of agricultural research in Ithaca. There have been numerous and meaningful scientific partnerships focusing on, in general, agriculture and health, genetics and metabolism, and agricultural systems biology. So for the next part of my presentation, I'd like to highlight just a number of these activities and identify particular people and particular collaborations that are very exciting. First of all, in the Biological Integrated Pest Management Research Group, there's been an ongoing ARS Cornell potato cyst nematode research program for over the last 40 years. And it's the only program in North America that has extensive expertise in potato cyst nematode biology, resistance breeding of potato, and management strategies. And it plays a vital role for the entire United States. Again, it was led previously by Bill Brody and Bob Playstead. The program now includes Zhou Hong Wong, 
collaborators at Cornell, Walter De Jong, Keith Perry, Don Hassel, with the APHIS program leader, Don Kepich, and the Ag and Markets coordinator, Bill Naston. It's really an exciting project, critically important, and as I sat in the front row earlier today, I heard discussions of the Golden Nematode project and how things need to move in the future. ARS ecologist Steve Wright works closely with Cornell entomologist John Sanderson on control of greenhouse pests, while ARS entomologist Lindsay Melbreth collaborates with Cornell weed scientist Tony D. Tommaso to develop biocontrol mechanisms for invasive plant species. Also in close collaboration, Stuart Gray and Cornell plant pathologist Keith Perry and BTI's George Jander focus on projects that involve understanding plant viruses and how they interact with plants. This team has provided innovative pest disease management systems that address the need for greener sustainable controls. In the Plant Soil and Nutrition Research Laboratory, there are a number of projects that I'd like to highlight. First of all, Ross Wells, Ross, Ross Relsh, and Ray Glons international work with human and animal nutrition, particularly their work with micronutrients, has been exemplary. Also Ross's leadership on crop biofortification, making crops more nutritious through the Generation Challenge Program has been recognized and internationally lauded. There's a relationship between three investigators, Jim Giovannoni from the ARS, Steve Tanksley at Cornell, and Greg Martin from BTI and Cornell. They've done landmark studies in the solanaceous crops, genome organization, crop domestication, and studies of natural variation, fruit quality development and ripening, and plant pathogen coevolution, signal transduction, and mechanisms for disease resistance. The work that they've done over the past decade has been incredible. Another really impressive project is the work of Doreen Ware, and Ed Buckler of ARS, along with Susan McCooch and people like Mark Sorrells at Cornell, responsible for the visionary ideas behind Grameen. This Grameen database is innovative and is a unifying factor in comparative genomics and cereal crops. In addition, as Leon highlighted, the first genomics and computational biology group at ARS was established at Cornell in the late 90s with Sam Kartner and Dave Schneider. And lastly, Coach and Buckler and hosts of others at Cornell focus on serial genomics and studies of natural diversity for abiotic stress resistance, mineral nutrition, and issues that deal with improved grain quality. And lastly, in the plant microbial interactions research, a group that involves Dave Schneider and Sam Kartnauer from ARS, Alan Colmer, Rose Luria, Greg Mort, and Mike Schuller from Cornell. Their uniquely collaborative insights on genome organization of the bacterium Pseudomonas syringae, the study of the evolutionary interactions between host and pathogen, and the work with disease resistance and plant resistance are landmarks. This group also pushed the envelope for applications of genomics, proteomics, and informatics to better understand basic biology in these key model organisms. In all of these projects and others that I didn't have time to highlight, I acknowledge the quality of the science and the scientists involved. I'd like to also emphasize that ARS and this laboratory in particular has done a wonderful job over the past decade recruiting thoughtful, innovative, energetic new scientists. It's very impressive to see the group of people that are now working with ARS unit. The scientists of the Holly Center will provide the continuing intellectual leadership that is essential to better understand plant biology and crop improvement in the 21st century. We acknowledge the important historical contributions of the U.S. Plant Soil and Nutrition Laboratory and look forward to the future progress with the Holly Center. Lastly, collaborative activities have worked well because of leaders, and they've been identified in this front row. But in particular, I'd like to uh, particularly acknowledge Wilda Martinez, who served as area director so ably over the past decade, and Dean Susan Henry, who's provided leadership over the past decade. Their commitment to excellence, their commitment to cooperation, and their commitment to building crop agriculture here is really impressive. So to you too, 
Thank you very much for your contributions. To Leo and the entire USDA ARS team, the regional and national leadership, and uh, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, Cornell thanks you very much. We look forward to collaborating with you in the future. Thanks very much and good luck. some more lights up for the videographers. Okay, okay, now, thank you, Steve. Now, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Antoinette Bechart. Dr. Bechart is the Associate Administrator of the 9,000-member Agricultural Research Service. She has previously served as the Area Director of the 8-State ARS Pacific West Area, and before that, Center Director for the ARS Western Regional Research Center in Albany, California. Dr. Bechart received her BS degree in foods and nutrition from UC Davis, her master's in human nutrition from Oregon State, and then she's a Cornellian. She got her PhD in food biochemistry and nutrition here at Cornell University. Dr. Bechart is a respected researcher and expert on the nutritional quality of cereal grains and legumes with a special interest in proteins and fiber. She was elected a fellow of the American Association of Cereal Chemists in 1995 and served as president of the American Association of Cereal Chemists in 1994. She was awarded the prestigious 2003 Presidential Rank Award for Distinguished Service for her leadership as area director, and in 1997 was awarded a Women in Science Engineering Award as one of the most outstanding women, women scientists in the federal government. Dr. Betchard. Thank you very much, Leon. It is wonderful to be with you today for many reasons, uh, for this renaming, rededication of our center as the Dr. Robert Holly Center. Personally, it's wonderful to be back in this beautiful environment. I must say, when one um, is a graduate student, you don't always appreciate the beauty quite as much as you do when you can come back and visit with the marvelous scientists as we did today. We basically are looking both to the past today, as we heard from Dr. Koshin. We heard some wonderful uh, challenges and opportunities uh, from Steve Kresovich. And since both of them did such a, a good job, I'll be able to uh, have a more cryptic, hopefully, presentation. As Dr. Kresovich mentioned, um, any collaboration and partnership of the quality that we, we uh, that is uh, USDA's Agricultural Research Service, which I represent and who's the, whose administrator is Dr. Nippling, any partnerships that we have or collaborations have everything to do with the quality of the people who lead the endeavors, as Steve just mentioned, as well as the quality of sciences and, and the commitment of those scientists when we enjoy these partnerships. The partnership and collegiality that we have enjoyed with, uh, with not only Cornell University, but also the Boyce Thompson Institute, um, is exemplary of how ARS functions throughout the nation in our more than 100 research centers and laboratories. We tend to be located mainly on university campuses for obvious reasons. Uh, working together, we have incredibly productive synergistic relationships. We've enjoyed a more than 60-year partnership here on the Cornell campus. And the basis of our relationship has been the ongoing both trust and synergy of that partnership. As Dr. Koshin has mentioned already, the, the nature of Dr. Holly's research is essentially much of what ARS does, and that is that basically we are committed to mission-oriented research and to that end, often conduct some of the most fundamental research. And of course, that was the case with, with Dr. Holly. Ultimately, out of that fundamental research comes both understanding, knowledge of mechanisms, but also equally important tools to move the science forward in terms of application for the food and agricultural sector. Today we're looking to the center and to the future in terms of the collaborations that we will enjoy based on the legacy that Dr. Holly has left us. 
There are just a few examples to build on some of what, again, Steve Kresovich mentioned, of the types of research that are now being conducted based mainly on genomics and the wonderful infrastructure that, e that emerges from that research. Three examples would be one very much coming out of the nutrition commitment, and that is um, through genomics and actually association mapping, the identification of a gene and actually a second gene that is responsible in maize for the synthesis of beta carotene, ultimately responding to or being converted to vitamin A. As many of you know, vitamin A is, uh, and its deficiencies are responsible for the majority of eye diseases and blindness um, in the world, especially in developing countries. And to that end, uh, we heard this morning that not only have the genes been identified, but as the paper was being published, they've already been, scientists have been implementing the use of the first gene, which enhanced beta carotene four times. And if this is used in combination with the second gene, uh, there is a 16-fold increase in beta carotene. I think just one very specific example of research coming from a very fundamental basis, which will have an incredible impact on people throughout the world. Another example um, in terms of association mapping was the collaboration that has resulted in, um, based on genomics coming out of the Solanaceous uh, projects, um, a number of tools that are being developed based on collaborations with Cornell scientists and ARS scientists leading what is the International Consortium on the Solanaceous Genomics Project. And that, of course, includes potato, tomato, and peppers, among others. The fact that this is an international consortium, I think, also is an example of the, the nature of science, um, especially in the genomics area. And this is that they are usually multifaceted and international. Thirdly, based on the expertise of the what was the Plant Cell Nutrition Laboratory, and of course currently the Holly Center. Also, uh, there have been uh, real strides in the area of how to utilize marginal lands, especially those with acid soils, where in fact some of the minerals can be in forms that are, that are toxic to plants. And to this end, I think we would look currently to the issues of food security, and this as uh, another example of a very specific outcome which impacts the food and agriculture sector and society coming out of the genomics arena. As we've heard uh, again from Steve, we know that basically partnerships of this, this nature do not come about automatically. And I think in the late, uh, the late 20th century, when Ms. Martinez became the area director of the North Atlantic area, was about the time that Dr. Judy St. John and Leland Ellis were also looking to opportunities to enhance uh, genomics-related research and bioinformatics combination of that teamwork and led by uh, the vision and leadership of Ms. Martinez has resulted in the expansion of the program that we have today and the quality of scientists that we have been able to attract to this center. I think many of us know that there are visionaries often. There are also people who bring leadership to the arena and are able to energize people. And thirdly, there are those who can actually implement very effectively and have the perseverance and tenacity to do that. We have in Wilda Martinez, who just retired recently, uh, the unique combination of all of those qualities. That is, a visionary, a strategic thinker, someone who has the ability to very effectively lead people, and also the specificity to ensure that the plans become implemented. I might also say that, at least in my view, the qualities of an exemplary leader is to genuinely be committed to the people with care, concern, and ensure that we continue to have the creative environments that we do that foster research. Having said that, the uh, scientists and especially the three research leaders here at the Holly Center 
wanted to take this opportunity to recognize Ms. Martinez, and that would, of course, be Dr. Leon Koshin, Dr. Dave Schneider, who unfortunately could not be with us today, and Dr. Donna Gibson. So with that, I would very much like to thank you, Wilda, and to say most people cannot see this, but I wonder if you would come up and receive it um, on behalf of the scientists and research leaders. It's a beautiful pin in the uh, style of the logo, of course, of transfer RNA. So Lovely. thank you very much. <laughs> Well, another individual who has been committed to research and education throughout his lifetime is the Undersecretary of the Research, Education, and Economics Mission Area for USDA. We're fortunate to have with us today, which is Dr. Gail Buchanan. Dr. Buchanan hails from the South, which he's very proud to tell everyone, and he's going to stay seated until I finish with my introduction, I think. <laughs> I told him it would be short, and it will be short. But basically, um, he was at the University of Alabama for the first 21 years, uh, working in weeds and in the, in the uh, Department of Agronomy and Soil Scientist, Sciences. He then uh, became um, director of the, Exper the Alabama Agricultural Experiment Station in 1986, moved to Georgia, and became the associate director of the Georgia Experiment Station. And about every 10 years, he's making major moves here. In 1995, he was appointed the Dean and Director of the University of Georgia's College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. And then just about a year ago, in May of 2000 and almost two years ago, 2006, uh, Dr. Buchanan was appointed the Undersecretary for our mission area. I give you Dr. Buchanan. Well, thank you, Tony. That was more than gracious for an old weed scientist. You know, it's truly an honor and a very special pleasure to be here today on behalf of all of the agencies in the Research, Education, Economics Mission area of U.S. Department of Agriculture to participate in the rededication of this center as the Robert W. Holley Center for Agriculture and Health, a tremendous combination. I think it should fill all of us with a sense of pride to note that Robert Holley was not only affiliated with U.S. Department of Agriculture's Agricultural Research Service, but was also affiliated with one of the nation's finest research institutions, Cornell University, which is New York's land-grant university. And this event today is a very true testament to the enduring value of the USDA slash land-grant university partnership. And today we are honoring one of our own. The 12th century theologian and author John of Salisbury once wrote, and I want to read, we're like dwarfs sitting on the shoulders of giants. We see more and things that are more distant than they did, not because our sight is superior or because we are taller than they, but because they raise us up and by their great stature add to ours. And that's exactly what Robert Holly did. He raised us up so that we could see further than we ever had before. Holly's research built upon the earlier work of James Watson and Francis Crick and all of that came about while I was just getting in college, so I read all of the exciting work. And those of you that were in grad school about that time remembers all of that. Now, some of you came along a little bit later. But uh, this was truly earth-shaking work. This changed the way how we thought about science in so many different ways. But it left one real unanswered question. How is the information in the DNA translated into protein? And that was a very critical issue because having just the structure of DNA was just part of the picture. And Dr. Holly's work elucidated the exact structure of transfer RNA and helped contribute to the answer to this very critically important question that was so important. The importance of his discovery cannot be overestimated. He and his fellow laureates who shared the 1968 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine added that final piece to the puzzle that enable the genetic code of life and pave the way for a tremendous boom in molecular biology and so many other areas of science that we take for granted today. It's important to note that Holly, as well as his fellow scientists who shared the 1968 Nobel Prize, Dr. Karana from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Dr. Nirenberg from the National Institutes of Health, 
were all part of the publicly funded research system in this country, and that's very, very important for us all to recognize. As Dr. Betchart noted in her remarks, Holly's research epitomizes the mission-oriented basic research this center has been doing since 1940. This is the essence of what our public research, education, and extension system does so well. Our federal laboratories and public universities generate fundamental research findings that fuel innovative and private investments in new technologies that's so important to our nation's continued economic growth and vitality. Clearly, support of research, particularly agricultural research, is an investment in our future. In addition to food for humans, feed for our livestock, fiber for our clothes and homes, flowers for our lawns, fins and feathers for our environment, agriculture is part of another major challenge that's facing us today, and that challenge is energy. Our public se sector program provides for a foundation of public good services and knowledge. And I can tell you that there's so many areas of science that are not proprietary that our public institutions must do if we're going to make the progress that we all dream of in the future. The fundamental research exemplified by what Dr. Hall and his colleagues did is being carried out in our federal laboratories and universities across this country. And as Holly's work demonstrated, what began as work in a small agricultural research laboratory led to monumental discoveries and laid the groundwork for countless other breakthroughs that have improved the quality of life for all of the people in this country. And this was not the first time that agricultural science has paved the way. I just want to cite just a couple of examples to illustrate the breadth of this effort that I've just been talking about. In 1889, Theobald Smith, a USDA scientist working on Texas cattle fever, became the first scientist to definitely link transmission of an infectious disease to an insect. He discovered that the protozoan agent responsible for the means of transmission by ticks and opened the way for the expl explanation of the transmission of human diseases such as yellow fever, malaria, and African sleeping sickness. This was monumental at that time. I think this was back in 1989. And for this and his other contributions, the American Society of Micro Microbiology calls Dr. Smith the greatest pioneer of American bacteriology. Another example, Selman Watsman was another pioneer who happened to be a soil scientist at another land-grant university, Rutgers, in New Jersey. In 1943, Watsman discovered a little soil microbe called Streptomyces greasis. Many people are probably more familiar with the antibiotic streptomycin. Selman Waxman, neither a physiologist nor a physician, won a Nobel Prize in, me in Physiology or Medicine in 1952. And his discovery really paved the way for many important contributions to the whole area of antibiotics and led to the antibiotics industry. Smith, Waxman, Holly, and countless others, and Cornell alone can count some 40 Nobel laureates, as I understand, are testament to the enduring value and contributions that have made and that continue to be made by our public research, education, and extension systems in this great country. All of these pioneers really made breakthrough discoveries that really made a difference in our lives. Holly's discovery paved the way for today's genomics and molecular biology research, which are key to the future of the nation's agricultural enterprise. Biotechnology holds a promise to solve many of the world's most vexing agricultural challenges, including developing sustainable bioenergy, water availability, disease and insect control, food security, and the list goes on. In fact, some of the same kind of research is being carried out right in the center today. Center scientists are using functional genomics to analyze complex traits in maize and biofuel grasses. Other center research are participating in the international effort to sequence the tomato, as already pointed out, as another important food. In recent years, scientists have made great progress in sequencing many agricultural important plants, animals, and microbial genomes. Sequences is either complete or well underway for the genomes of cows, hogs, corn, rice, soybeans, listeria, and even E. coli 0157. Using these new maps, scientists are now identifying and characterizing and manipulating useful genes in these genomes, generating information that will allow scientific discoveries and advances in developing disease-resistant plant varieties, improving food safety, and enriching nutrients in foods we eat. Dr. Holly's work provided a critical link in the continuing chain of knowledge which is so fundamental to the success of agriculture, and more importantly, to the success of our nation. 
The rededication of this center as the Robert W. Holly Center for Agriculture and Health is a fitting and lasting reminder of the contributions of science to this nation. I congratulate Dr. Cochain and all of the scientists and staff at this center. I also want to thank Dr. Susan Henry, Dr. Steve Tankersley, the Provost, the Vice President for Governmental Affairs, Steve Johnson, for the advocacy of this center and for all who have contributed and supported the collaborative relationship that we enjoy between the U.S. Department of Agriculture and this land-grant university. Seeing what is going on in this laboratory, it's easy to understand the enthusiasm those involved have. Doing research that makes life a little better for everybody is indeed a very, very high calling. I commend you for your efforts and wish you well in the future. And I can tell you I had the opportunity of visiting down at Geneva this morning and seeing the enthusiasm and the cooperative relationship that we have and enjoy between U.S. Department of Agriculture and Cornell University. If that doesn't make you feel good, you probably no hope for you because this is really exciting. <laughs> and seeing the research that's going on that does make a difference is truly exciting. And, and I don't know how you can say it any other way. I sometimes think I have the best job in America because I get to see and visit with scientists doing work that does make a difference in our lives. So I can't say enough about that, but so I know I've got to do my next task. And it is a very special honor to introduce the key advocate of the Robert W. Holly Center for Agriculture and Health. And I didn't get the chance to meet the congressman beforehand, but I get the chance to introduce you, congressman. In addition to supporting the work of this center as a member of the House Appropriations Committee, Congressman Maurice Hinchy has been a strong advocate for the integrity of American agriculture, focusing on protecting the family farm and the quality and safety of the food supply. Now, that's what I had written down. But I want to tell you, I talked to a lot of people this morning. I asked everybody I saw about the congressman. I said, does he know anything about agriculture? And I got some very positive answers, Congressman. Apparently, you have a very good reputation in terms of supporting agriculture and the work that we're trying to do in research and education. And I can tell you that that makes a difference because it, all the things that we do, we depend upon appropriations and depend upon the support of our elected officials, and they play a very critical role in the process. And I clearly recognize, understand, and appreciate that. And I also want to tell you something else, too. A lot of people don't realize that New York is a key agricultural state. A lot of people think the only agriculture is in the Midwest or the South or way out on the West Coast. But let me tell you something. New York has a tremendous agricultural portfolio, and having someone such as you that supports that is very important, and we appreciate it. And at this time, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable Maurice Henchy. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be part of this, uh, this ceremony today. One of the most interesting and, and exciting and, and, frankly, fulfilling aspects of uh, my job as a member of the House of Representatives is representing this wonderful place, Cornell University, and especially the Center for Agriculture and Health. And that's uh, one of the main reasons why uh, I have chosen over the course of the last quite a number of years now to serve on the subcommittee on agriculture on the appropriations committee to deal with uh, with this issue it's it's critically important all the work that you do here food and fiber is the essence for the maintenance of life among our species and virtually everything else on this planet so it's a very critical situation and I thank you for everything you do and I'm very very delighted to be associated with you I want to thank you Dr. Buchanan Thank you very much for being here today. And uh, I want to thank you all also for all the contributions you make, all the great work that you do. It's a great pleasure to have you here, and I'm, and I'm awfully glad that you, you took the time to come up and spend some, some time with us. And it's also a great pleasure to be here today for the naming and rededication of the Robert W. Holly Center for Agriculture and Health. I want to commend Dr. Kochian and the members of his team on their world-class and wide-ranging research in fundamental biology and plant sciences. By looking at plants on their most basic genetic molecular levels, your work is transforming agriculture in the United States and around the world. I also want to single out Susan Henry, Dean of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and Steve Krasovich, Vice Provost for Life Science at Cornell University for their commitment to excellence at Cornell. 
It would be easy for an Ivy League university of Cornell stature to play down its land-grant status, but you have never wavered in your mission to serve this state, the state of New York. The close collaboration between the federal scientists and the university scientists on both the Ithaca and Geneva campuses should serve as a model, really, for the rest of the country. I'm extremely proud to represent both the Robert W. Holly Center for Agriculture and Health and Cornell University. As the previous speakers have noted, the work done by Dr. Holly and by all of the scientists at this center is a testament to the reasons why the federal government should invest in science. Basic research, science for the sake of science, is the cornerstone of innovation. Without a base of fundamental knowledge to draw from and build upon, many of the technologies that we now take for granted today would still be science fiction. Dr. Holly's Nobel Prize winning work with alanine transfer RNA is a prime example of how a basic discovery can lay the groundwork for a revolution in biology and plant sciences. It is fundamental work like this, work that is basic enough that companies driven by quick profits struggle to justify investing in, yet is so vital to our understanding of how nature and the world in which we live actually works, how that world actually works, that the federal government must continue to fund. That is essential. We cannot afford to pass up opportunities to further our knowledge and understanding of nature, and it is a chief responsibility of the federal government to just make sure that we do not give that up. Funding for science, and especially agricultural science, has taken a beating, frankly, in the federal budget over the past several years. Congress doubled the budget for biomedical research at the National Institutes of Health between 1998 and 2003. But since that time, the budget has not kept pace with inflation, and the small annual increases at NIH have come at the insistence of Congress, and sometimes over the President's objections. Currently, we're trying to double the budget for the physical, physical sciences. At the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy's Office of Science, and the National Institute of Standards and Technology, all of those things we are focusing our attention on, we want to double the budget for those essential activities. The President's budget this year includes an increase for these programs. However, when push comes to shove, the administration's commitment to science takes a back seat to other priorities. The Supplemental Appropriations Bill currently pending in Congress is a good case in point. At the end of last year, as we worked on the funding bills for 2008, it became clear that the President would not sign individual appropriations bills that spent more than what he had requested the Congress to provide. We had no acceptable choice other than to combine 10 bills into a single omnibus spending bill that hit the President's targets. As I'm sure many people in this audience know, the physical sciences were one of the casualties of that process. Congress is currently considering a supplemental appropriations bill to address funding shortfalls in fiscal year 2008 budgets. Over the administration's strong objections, we've included $1.2 billion for science programs, including $100 million for the Office of Science itself. $150 million for NSF, $200 million for NASA, and $400 million for NIH. The President has issued a veto threat, which I am not sure we have the votes to override, but we'll see. We'll see how that works out. Environmental sciences at NASA, NOAA, the USGS, and the EPA will also struggle in the current set of circumstances involving the budget. No agency, however, feels the brunt of this set of circumstances and the cuts to science as deeply as the USDA. When you look at it over the long term, the federal budget for agricultural research has remained virtually flat for decades, just about three of those decades. If the Farm Bill ever passes, we might see some new money directed at specialty crops and biofuels, but it's not enough to keep pace with the pressing need to feed a growing population. 
Indeed, the Gates Foundation will spend more on agricultural research this year than we have budgeted in the National Research Initiative. And while most of the Gates money is targeted at the poorest countries with the greatest needs, the recent spike in food prices here at home shows that despite all the gains we've made over the past century, we still need to invest in agricultural research in the United States of America. Instead, the administration proposes to cut 15% from USDA's research budget. The Agricultural Research Service alone would lose $84 million. They justify these cuts by claiming that all that they are doing is removing earmarks that the administration didn't ask for. I know because I put some of them in myself. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm very proud of it. But a few of those so-called earmarks pay the salaries of some of the scientists here at the Holly Center. Among the so-called earmarks that the administration has targeted for elimination in this year's budget is funding to build two new ARS labs in New York. One here in Ithaca, adjacent to the Holly Center, and of course the one up in Geneva. As Dr. Kochian and Dr. Kresovich illustrated so clearly in their remarks, the ARS has outgrown its space and is spilling over onto the Cornell campus. I don't doubt that President Scorton is pleased to share his space with the ARS, but I think it's a shame that this president can spend over $10 billion a month on a military occupation in Iraq, but the administration can't agree to find just $50 million to build a laboratory to house some of the most talented and dedicated scientists that we have in our country. Well, I thank you for that. <laughs> As just, just one, just one member of Congress, I can't promise that we'll give basic research that the place deserves in this year's budget. I can't even promise that we'll get a budget done on time. I wish I could. We're trying very hard, and we may. We may get it done on time. But I can assure you that I will keep fighting to see that the scientists at the Holly Center and at Cornell are not overlooked this year. We're going to do everything possible, and we're going to work together, I know, to, to get that done. So let me just say, finally, that you are, I know, and you can be very proud of all that you've accomplished. Federal Plant, Soil, and Nutrition Laboratory. It's with great pleasure that I join you in celebrating the achievements of one of the most celebrated scientists of our time by naming this facility the Robert W. Holly Center for Agriculture and Health for him. It's a real great pleasure to have the opportunity to spend this time with you, to listen to all of the interesting things that were said and presented here today, and to be part of this with you. I should say continue to be part of this with you. Thanks very much.